I want to take this uh, moment to introduce uh, Professor Jim King. Uh, Jim is one of the quiet powerhouses of the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, <laughs> he, he is in some ways a gatekeeper. Uh, in Wyoming uh, statutory law, there is one course that must be taught to people taking higher education in Wyoming, and that is a course in the Wyoming Constitution. And Jim has not only taught this course since his arrival at UW uh, 20 years ago, quite often, but he is also the primary writer and editor for the book, The Equality State, Government and Politics in Wyoming, now in its seventh edition. He has edited uh, or been written uh, in five of the ed editions, and this course could not be taught if it was not for Jim. Um, in addition, Jim has been uh, department head uh, for most of the years since 2000, and I don't know if I should say it quite this way, but the political science department is, is a department that has its fingers in a, in a number of pies. It not only has a bachelor's uh, degree that is quite popular among the students, but it also uh, runs a master's of public administration. And that's not just uh, a degree that you can come down to campus and take. In fact, it is an outreach degree, and they have been offering this degree since long before outreach was a popular thing for universities, and particularly university administrators, uh, to be pushing. Because of that, the political science department has one of the largest outreach enrollments of all of the departments in the College of Arts and Sciences. And when we say that in the context of the University of Wyoming, uh, that's quite an achievement because, of course, the College of Arts and Sciences is larger than all the other colleges put together. And I don't say that because I happen to be a member of that college. That, that's actually true. Um, Jim's research, uh, of, of which there are pages and pages of articles and, and publications and, and, and uh, speeches when you, when you look at his uh, survey, he's interested in political leaders. And by leaders, he means executive leaders. So there's a whole bunch of back and forth of articles over his career between various aspects of the presidency, of getting elected into the presidency, of figuring out how to be a president once you actually get elected, on the one hand, and governors on the other hand. And how do governors uh, relate to their constituencies within the states, and what are the different uh, dynamics of that? And one last uh, thing I want to point to Jim uh, about is that, you know, when you, when, you know, we're in an election season, and in addition to all the ads, of course, that uh, we get in on our uh, satellite channels, um, we get a lot of pundits uh, trying to give us the state of politics in this place or in that place, uh, in this state or in that state, and how do we explain it and how do we understand it. And Jim has been running the Wyoming Election Year Survey for uh, almost a decade and a half. Um, and so when they want to know what's going on in Wyoming, or when we want to know what's going on in the Wyoming political scene, Jim is the man that we turn to. So right now, I'd like to turn to Jim and hear what he has to say on Election Year 2012, Democracy in the Wake of the Citizens United Decision. I was thinking a few minutes ago, uh, as, as Ann was finishing up, we started with Hart Martin and, you know, internment of American citizens. That's a real up good feeling topic. <laughs> Healthcare and people getting sick and dying. That's a real up topic. And now we're going to negative campaign commercials. <laughs> Boy, did we bring you people in today for a moment. Um, whoop. Actually, uh, this is one of my favorite. Uh, and I go, lawyers here, all sorts of copyright infringements going on. Um, they don't know where to give it. But this, this, this kind of reflects, in many respects, uh, uh, I think a lot of our attitudes about um, modern politics. That you know, we get so much uh, negativism that that it just you know feels like we're getting bombarded. But don't forget, um, 
Andrew Jackson blamed his political opponents for his wife's death, that the attacks on him were in the election of 1824 were so harsh that made her physically ill and contributed to her death. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was portrayed as a baboon in campaign, in printed campaign advertisements. So don't get the, the thought that, that the negativism we experience today is, is anything new. Um, it's been around a while. Anybody know who this gentleman is? It's an old photograph, as you can tell. He is the reason we even started campaign finance reform. His name was Mark Hanna. He was Republican National Committee chairman in the 1890s, and he started a little bit of program to, you know, the Republicans, the dominant political party in the, in the Civil War and post-Civil War era, but uh, a fellow by the name of Grover Cleveland had the audacity to win a couple of elections as a Democrat. And so in 1896, Hannah was determined that uh, Republicans were going to have the finances they needed, and he went around the country going to corporate leaders and, in essence, giving them assessments, how much they needed to be putting up to support uh, the Republican campaigns of that year. And it varies which, which source you look at. Uh, some say that he raised three and a half million dollars, which today we chuckle. That's, a, that's not even a competitive Senate race uh, to, in today's figures. Uh, but with a lot of money then, some estimates are as high as ten million dollars uh, were raised. Uh, certainly we didn't have any type of, of uh, accurate accounting. But it was this pleasure with what things like Hannah, people like Hannah were doing, uh, that led Teddy Roosevelt, a name we've already heard, uh, to be the first president to push for campaign finance reform. And we will come back to these people later because in some respects uh, they are, uh, if you will, uh, not the equivalents of uh, Mark Hanna, but certainly influential people. Now just to give you an idea, this is graphing uh, campaign expenditures. Uh, the solid green line is in actual dollars. The dotted uh, uh, orange line is adjusted for inflation. And so even if you adjust for inflation over the last 48 years, uh, campaign fine, uh, expenditures have gone up. And certainly, if you look what's happened uh, in actual dollars, the number in and this is all, this is all money spent on campaigns, presidential campaigns. And so uh, you see the huge increases the last two cycles. This is just the, the uh, inflation adjusted dollars. And you see a rise in uh, the 1960s that prompted moves for campaign finance reform. The middle section is what I call the public funding era, when the public funding program was adopted and was dominant. But by 2004, that has so become somewhat antiquated. And you've seen then the increase of, of money spent in 2004, and then the 2008 election uh, being much, much higher. And I'm guessing uh, when the data are finally accumulated, uh, we're going to look at the, the 2012 election as being the most expensive of all. Just some idea. Uh, over the, the first part of the 20th century, some various campaign finance reforms, a ban on direct corporate contributions was the first thing. This came while Teddy Roosevelt was president in the 1907, I think 07. Uh, was the Tillman Act. Ban on direct labor union spending came in later. Uh, they did have a very weak reporting of expenditures of campaigns for Congress. It was adopted in the first half of the 20th century, but with no federal agency to really collect and organize and make these available. You know, you know all this was was filed papers that were filed and go anywhere. And then uh, political action committees came into being uh, in this time. Again, a political action committee is an organization that may, raises money for spent. <coughs> 
excuse me, spending and contributions uh, to candidates. And that's all it exists for. Uh, some of them are extensions, classic PACs, many of them are extensions of existing interest groups. Um, uh, you know, the political victory fund of the NRA is, is an example of that. NRA has a whole lobbying operation for uh, particular policies. It has a separate then PAC that is affiliated with that. In the 1970s, first big push um, for major reform, reporting requirements were enhanced. Federal Election Commission was created to actually have an agency to collect and, and make available these data. The two big things that were, uh, th big three things, contribution limits. No longer could you simply give as much money as you wanted to to a candidate. Candidates could not spend unlimited amounts. How much you could spend on a race was going to be capped. And the public financing of presidential campaigns came into being. Um, to clear up one misperception, public funding of, of uh, presidential campaigns is not a post-Watergate reform. It was a pre-Watergate reform. Nixon agreed to sign the legislation, including that, only if it would not take effect until 1976. He wanted... <laughs> uh, and, and the reporting, the change in reporting requirements that, that came in uh, with this legislation also took place, took effect in April of 1972, and most of the activities, illegal campaign fundraising activities that took place were before April, so they would not have to report what they were doing. You only had to report money you raised after, I think it was April 4th. And so all of the, what, what that, those of us who were old enough to remember all of, uh, what was going on then, all of that illegal stuff in terms of campaign finance occurred before the law kicked in. The big thing, immediately, of course, Americans are Oliticus people. Uh, the laws were immediately challenged. The Supreme Court in Buckley v. Faleo, 1976, made two major rulings. One, campaign spending is constitutionally protected free speech and cannot be limited. Now, there are, yes, limits on people who participated in the public financing. Okay. In this operation, no different than uh, federal money to highways, right? Why does Wyoming and every other state have a seatbelt law? because you lose federal funding if you don't have that, okay? If you took the federal public financing money for campaigns, you had to agree to these spending limits. If you didn't take the money, spend as much as you like, uh, and was, which is what happened starting in, in uh, 2004. Donations could be limited. The court, uh, in something of a convoluted reasoning, uh, that there was an interest in uh, protecting democracy. Congress had a legitimate interest in protecting democracy and not allowing uh, a few individuals to dominate the process so that you couldn't tell a candidate he or she could not spend whatever money was available, but you could tell individuals that you can't make excessive contributions to individual, to, to candidates for public office. We might as well skip everything between 1976 and, and, and uh, uh, 2010 because uh, the Supreme Court chipped away at other aspects. McCain-Feingold got a lot of attention uh, a decade ago, and most of it was overturned by the court. Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. Supreme Court, the big thing was that it overturned the ban on corporate uh, independent expenditures. You know, corporations now can put the, their own treasury, rather than f separately forming a political action committee, what corporations would do was uh, they would form a political action committee by soliciting donations from their stockholders and their employees to the PAC. And then the PAC would make contributions to individual candidates. What they were saying, what, what the, the Supreme Court said in Citizen United was this concept of, of expenditures and campaigns being an issue of free speech applied to corporations. They said corporations were e legally people in other contexts. And so spending out of the campaign treasury, or the, the corporation treasury was now uh, open. The Federal Election Commission 
then with this ruling in place said, okay, the same should apply to labor unions. And so, so labor unions were not freed up by Citizens United directly, but as an FEC ruling that followed this decision. They did uphold, however, reporting and disclaimer requirements. You know, the disclaimer requirements, which were part of, basically the main part of McCain final, final McCain fine gold, excuse me, that's lasted, is the disclaimer. You know, I'm Mitt Romney and I approve this message. I'm Barack Obama, I approve this message, whatever. Uh, you know, this message was, uh, you know, that, that, citizen, that uh, Restore Our Future is responsible for the, for the content of this message and is not affiliated with any candidate. Okay, those disclaimers uh, are relatively new and they are uh, le it's legal to require that. So this was actually a major problem. Do you have a question? Just so, I, just so I understand this. You said that there was a limit previously on the amount of money that an individual could donate to a campaign. Okay. Yes. Now, with this, with the corporate issue, a corporation has, let's pretend it has 200 shareholders. Okay? Let's pretend of those 200, someone on either side that 100 of those shareholders want to support candidate A. Are they limited by the number of shareholders they have to the amount of money that they can donate to the campaign? No. So that so those two things. So okay, well there's there, it's, it's a very there, there's some very uh, fine language in your question that I will address if you if you'll give me a minute. Okay. Uh, uh, in terms of, of what corporations can and cannot do. Actually, un, under the radar, but actually, the, in, some, in many respects, the more important decision, speechnow.org, is actually a decision by the uh, appellate court, U.S. Appellate Court in the District of Columbia. What this one did was overturned limits on contributions by whomever to independent expenditure only political action committees. We know independent expenditure only political action committees as super PACs. This was the decision that actually opened the floodgate to the super PACs that uh, so much concern has been raised about uh, in the last couple of years. That, and which is why the title I gave Paul was, you know, Democracy in the Wake of, of Citizens United, and when I was putting the, the title uh, slide together for this, it says Citizens United and Other Decisions, because in some ways, speechnow.org by uh, the FEC is a more important decision. And it, it's relying on, it's a progeny. It, you know, uh, Citizens United's logic was what the appellate court used in this decision, so I mean, it's an extension uh, of Citizens United in a way. But this is what opened the door to super PACs. Okay, this is where I'll get to some of the, probably the questions you have. And what, one of the things I like to do is try to, you know, help people understand, you know, what really is going on, because there's so much out there that we wonder about. Corporates, corporations and labor unions can now make direct contributions to candidates. True or false? False. They cannot make contributions directly to candidates. They have to give to an independent committee. You know, the, all those, that ban on direct contributions that a corporation or a labor union would give to an individual candidate all remain in place. Individuals and PACs can now make unlimited contributions to candidates. False. Now the, the, I, I think I've got these numbers right. I know the PAC numbers right. I think it's 2,500 this year. Is 2,500 per election per person to a candidate uh, is the way the language is written. So basically, an individual can give a maximum of, of $5,000 to either Romney or Obama. Uh, you could only give 2,500 to Gingrich because Gingrich didn't get past the primary, the, the nomination stage. This, is, this was all the hand-wringing in the wake of uh, Citizens United. And, and I've used, uh, there are 773, if I remember the count correctly, super PACs, expenditure-only uh, 
committees registered with the Federal Election Commission. I did not go through all 773 campaign finance reports. Nobody has aggregated these data yet. Uh, so if you want to know, you can go to the Federal Election Commission website, you can click on uh, the independent expenditure only committees, uh, and you can get the full list of them, you can go one by one. Uh, I decided that for only two of them would I go through the uh, September, August, July, June, May, you know. I went, I've gone through ten on each of these, looking for their, their contributors. Uh, of the million dollar donors, okay, and uh, that, was, that was kind of an interesting uh, uh, cutoff point. You know, that's a nice round number that we all aspire to. <laughs> uh, so uh, this, is, this is, you know, if you look at it, the gold is how much has been given uh, to these two political actors. Restore Our Future is the pro-Romney, Priorities USA Action is the, is the pro-Obama super PAC. And you see the, the, the ratio, how much, much more of it is uh, the million dollar donors have given to uh, our individuals rather than a few businesses uh, to Romney's, uh, to the pro-Romney PAC, and a couple of labor unions have given a million dollars to uh, the pro-Obama PAC. But, and, and I've, I've looked scattered at some others, uh, other uh, uh, super PAC reports, and you don't see the corporations. It's individuals that are the ones that are really putting uh, the money. Again, now keep in mind the super. Uh, the, uh, I'm just basing. Okay. Uh, oh. Speechnow.org. Yeah, that's the one I'm trying to remember. Uh, that you know, they said individuals can now give unlimited amounts rather than before. Like as an individual, if you want to give to, or I want to give to a standard political action committee, I'm limited. Just like I'm limited to what I can give to a candidate. But an independent expenditure only, that is you're going to operate independently, uh, now individuals can get unlimited to that. These are a couple of the pictures you saw earlier. These are the two biggest of the uh, donors, the, th the, the three biggest of the donors to Restore Our Future. Uh, I think I recall that the New York Times has documented since this uh, has been passed that corporations have made funds available to their officers to make private donations. Ah! Uh, that I'm not familiar with, because the, quest the question was that, uh, about the, or the statement was that, that the Times, New York Times had documented that, that corporations are making av money available to their uh, employees, their officers, to make direct contributions. I'm not enough of a campaign finance lawyer, but what's popping in the back of my head is the, the misreporting. I mean, much of what, what got people in trouble under Watergate in terms of campaign finance was corporate money being given to individuals to make, uh, in essence, shadow contributions. Uh, I mean, that's what uh, George Steinbrenner, uh, you know, his, his, before, before the New York Yankees, his prominence uh, in, was in politics, and what got him in trouble in Watergate was he gave corporate money to individuals who then uh, made contributions to Nixon's campaign. Uh, and, and that was an illegal use of you know, transfer of funds. So I'm not, I'm not really certain. Uh, there are a lot. For example, Bob Perry is uh, a, uh, uh, in the construction business in Texas, uh, has made a lot of money in that regard. Uh, you know, I don't know that, you know, it's reported as a contribution from him. Uh, Sheldon uh, Adelson is a businessman in uh, Las Vegas. Miriam Adelson is a physician in, in Las Vegas, they have each given in their own names five million dollars to restore our future. And these are the two biggest contributors to uh, uh, Priorities Action, U Priority Priorities USA Action. Uh, most, the most in is a uh, lawyer in Texas. Um, and uh, Irvin Jake, uh, Jacobs is the uh, Qualcomm communications uh, company uh, founder. Again, these are the biggest ones. I mean, there, there, there are two labor unions who have given a million dollars to Priorities USA. I think it was, 
it's either five or six corporations have given a million dollars or more to uh, uh, restore our future. But again, most of the money is coming from individuals. Both Romney and Obama have raised far more money than their associated super PACs. This is as of, this would be the end of August. Uh, the, the, this is out of the September report, which goes through the end of August. Uh, Romney's individual campaign had raised $274 million. Uh, Restore Our Future had raised 97. And then you see Obama, uh, how much he has raised, and Priorities USA has only raised uh, 36 million. And this is cumulative for the election cycle. Uh, so you, you know, the candidates are still relying on contributions to their campaigns for, uh, you know, a large part of the operation. Now, it varies from particular campaign to particular election and all of this, but, you know, say, say Romney spends this entire uh, 274 million dollars. You know. uh, something uh, about 135 to 140 million of that will be on television advertisement. Generally what we know in modern campaigns is they spend something between 40 and 50 percent of their budgets on television advertisements. The rest of it goes to you know the cost of the airplane that flies in the round, the cost of the campaign staff, uh, the cost of the fundraising operation, um, you know, that's pretty substantial. You know, 270 million or 432 million doesn't just happen to come in off the street. You know, they go out and get it. Uh, and so, but still, uh, almost half their budget is going to go to uh, campaign advertisement. Well, okay, now if he spends 140 million, he's still outspending the super PAC, which is almost entirely. Uh, campaign advertise, advertising spending. You know, they, they have their administrative cost as well. Uh, so, I mean, the, 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 my point here is the candidates themselves are still the dominant players in this game in terms of campaign finance and what they're doing. This one's a little harder to answer. Super PAC leaders typically have ties to the candidates. These are two of the leaders of uh, Restore Our Future and Priorities USA. Chris Spies, uh, treasurer of Restore Our Future, his name's on all the, the uh, campaign finance reports. He was general counsel for Romney for president in 2008. He was muckety-muck, if you will, in the campaign. Uh, organization. Bill Burton is one of two uh, major strategists for Priorities USA Action. Uh, he was pr Deputy Press Secretary for President Obama and Press Secretary for Candidate Obama. The other big name, just I just put two up, one from each. The other big one for Priorities USA Action is Sean Sweeney, uh, who has a, a very long and, and well-respected career on Capitol Hill as a uh, congressman, but was a top assistant to Rahm Emanuel when Emanuel was uh, chief of staff in the White House. So, okay, are they operating independently of each other? Yes. They're not coordinating, they're not calling, you know, uh, Bill Burton doesn't call uh, the people over at the Obama for America operation and say, you know, where are you running your ads and where do you want us to run ours? They don't do anything like that. Uh, but, you know, they know the candidates, they've worked with these candidates. They can see what the, the campaign is doing. You know, you know, Burton's seeing the same campaign ads by the, the uh, uh, Obama campaign that we're seeing. So he knows what themes they're emphasizing and what themes then that they feel they can emphasize to Obama's benefit. For the most part, Uh, probably congressional races are going to get some more attention as things develop, but the focus of super PACs, the people putting in big money, has been on the presidential races so far. Uh, this is just to give you an idea 
Uh, this was as of a report that I found that went, this is an FEC report that accumulated the data through June 30th. Uh, the gold is the presidential campaign uh, in terms of, of what they're uh, spending independently of the candidate. This does not include contributions to candidates directly. But the super PACs, very clearly their emphasis has been on the presidency. Uh, the political parties, relatively little uh, on either uh, candidate, either presidential or congressional candidate. Again, a qualified answer. Republican super PACs have spent more money, but that's because Republicans had a competitive nomination race. Okay. All the candidates had their own uh, campaigns. These are the leading super PACs, and the leader, the, the definition here was uh, having raised $2 million or more. That was my cutoff point for really calling them a super PAC. Uh, and this was, I think this is as of the end of July. Uh, the ones above the dotted line are presidential candidate oriented. The ones below the dotted line on each side are congressional oriented. So you see most of the money, uh, it, particularly on the Democratic side, uh, is uh, going to congressional candidates. And you know, there's some that's interesting. Um, uh, Texas Conservatives uh, Fund, five and a half million dollars to beat one candidate. This was this, the only interest of this, at least at the time that this report was, was put up uh, available, the only candidate was beating, and I can't remember the candidate's name now, but de defeating the other Republican candidate in Texas so that Cruz would be the Republican nominee for the U.S. Senate to replace Kay Bailey Hutchinson. Uh, I mean, that was all they did. That's all they did was go after that one candidate. Uh, Club for Growth, American Crossroads, which is uh, uh, Karl Rove, uh, operation. Most of these have been focusing on congressional races, relatively little in presidential, uh, and this has been Republican versus Republican type of competition. Uh, uh, there was, I think it was Club for, uh, for Growth Action was the one that went after Dick Luger in Indiana, or more accurately, officially was supporting Murdoch, but was, was going after Luger. Uh, now you see on the Democratic side, majority PAC and House majority PAC, uh, these are congressional oriented and these are focusing more on supporting a Democratic candidate rather than choosing one Democratic candidate over another. But again, my point is, yeah, there's a lot of money out there uh, and presidential campaigns have been getting the most of it, but I think as we get into the general, there may be much, something of a shift. at least on the presidential level. Uh, you, you may tell I love graphs. God, I love Excel. <laughs> My students hate me for loving Excel, but... Uh, okay, the gold is what each... And this is, let's see, this is uh, Romney, Gingrich, Santorum, Paul, one of these is Huntsman, I'm spacing a name here. What is it? Perry. 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 Yeah. Perry. I think, I think this, is, this was Perry's and this was Huntsman's. You can kind of see what happened and why they were gone early. Um, the gold is what was spent pro-candidate. You know, organizations supporting the candidate they were formed to organize. And most of these, uh, that's what they did. Now you can see Romney, the red line, is, the red part of it is what Romney spent against other Republicans. Okay, he's, his, or, or, excuse me, Romney did not. Restore our future spent, I need to be careful of my language here, uh, on behalf, you know, attacking other Republican candidates. And if you watch the campaigns last spring, uh, if you want, follow the news, of course, we didn't actually get to see the ads, but if you follow the news, they really went after Santorum and Gingrich uh, in Iowa and in the other early can uh, can states. Excuse me. So um, you can see what happened. Okay, Priorities USA Action, um, 
nothing but anti Romney, pretty much. I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure that there's some, there, you know, there's ten or twenty dollars in there somewhere that's pro Obama. Uh, <laughs> just like I'm sure there's ten or twenty dollars uh, in the most recent uh, thirty million dollars that uh, Romney has spent. Uh, or excuse me, restore our future has spent that, that would be pro-candidate. So I mean, it's one of those things that uh, in these, we've got two, can, two campaigns, two pa super PACs that have gone the negative route. And most of the others have gone the positive route. If you look at the breakdown of, of other super PACs, ones that have been more uh, congressionally oriented, they are a mix of, of you know, again, Texas Conservatives Fund went uh, to support Cruz went all negative. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I'm spacing the candidate's name in, in Texas. Uh, you know, in, in Indiana, you saw the, the same, a mix of pro candidate, uh, anti Luger uh, type of ads. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. Uh, I've got some ad, you know, I, I was going to link into some ads, but we'll move ahead to save some time. Uh, negative advertisements. That's what I was going to show you a couple of those, but I'm sure you've seen them. Uh, those of us who live down in uh, southeastern Wyoming and get a lot of our media out of Denver, Colorado is a battleground state. I'm not joking, and, and, and Paul, Eric, and, and Ann can confirm this. It is not unheard of in the two minutes between news segments on the 6 o'clock news to have an ad by Restore Our Future blasting Obama, an ad by Priorities USA blasting Romney, a pro-Romney ad by Romney's own campaign, and a pro-Obama by Ro Obama's campaign. In the same four mi two minute segment, you get th th four 30 second ads from the, the, the four big players and on the two sides of the candidates. It's just amazing. Uh, I'm, 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 it's almost like, I, if I see something come on in black and white, now you see there, there is, there is in the science of making campaign advertisements. People have studied this. Color, bright vivid color is a pro ad. Shades of gray is a negative ad. <laughs> watch, watch the ads. Listen to the, listen to the voiceover. It's morning in America again. Now, those of you, old, those of us old enough to remember the Reagan campaign, it's it's bright, it's breezy, it's warm. Under President Obama, you know, you, again, you know, hey, the people that do these ads are not amateurs. No, I'm serious. They're specialists. They're specialists in in what they do and. You know, I, they, they test campaign ads in the same way Campbell's test ads are going to make you buy their soup over, over Progresso, you know? I mean, uh, they know what works and what doesn't. Uh, but the question is, negative campaign advertisement, turn off voters and reduce voter turnout. Very serious question for democracy. <laughs> what studies have shown, I love being wishy-washy. What studies have shown is that, and I'll start at the bottom one here, the supporters of the candidates, those people that have been for Romney and for Obama, those ads are just, yeah, you know, that's, that's right. Boy, that, that, that other guy is so bad, and I'm going to make sure I get out there and vote, and, and I will respond to that, that appeal for another $100 donation to the campaign. And, you know, those who are uh, generally, I don't want to say apolitical, because that, that probably takes it too far, but are not fully engaged in politics. Remember, 55% of the eligible people will vote in November. Okay? So we've got 45% out there who is, uh, they, they aren't really interested anyway, and this certainly doesn't do anything to get them engaged and get them interested. So you have a situation where some people who are on the edge of being turned off are definitely turned off. So there is a negative effect to uh, uh, negative campaign advertisements. Uh, 
Okay, now if there's a negative attack, you know, in fact, why they do it? Well, as I said, part of it is that it does energize the base of the candidate. And the other thing is they do work. Okay? They do work to a point. Again, I'm dating myself a little bit, but the most fascinating to me, the most fascinating media campaign of any candidate was George Bush's campaign in 1988. George Herbert Walker Bush. Okay, if you remember that campaign, right after the, the convention, Mike Dukakis had a pretty big lead after the Republican convention, or excuse me, after the Democratic convention, and still had a modest lead after the Republican convention. So Bush's campaign advertisements focused on... Willie, okay, no, no, Bush's did not focus, he, Bush never showed a Willie Horton ad. That was, a, that was an independent expenditure committee on behalf of Bush. He, Bush's own ad was the prison furlough that had a revolving gate, where if, if you remember, you might remember, where prisoners were seen walking through the gate in a, you know, one of those revolving turnstile things and walking right back out again. That was Bush's ad. Okay, it was also pollution in Boston Harbor. It was also, uh, you know, that, you know, the Democrats would raise taxes. Okay, those were the things. And man, they just hammered, they just hammered Mike Dukakis. You know, what had happened was Al Gore in the Democratic primaries had shown these were the issues that Dukakis was vulnerable on and the Bush people took advantage of it and just hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered until their polling had shown that it was starting to have a reverse effect. There's a boomerang, there's a point of boomerang effects in negative campaign advertisement. And boy, it went like this. And suddenly it was George Bush with the, the kids and the grandkids and the bright sunny colors and the happy voices and the uplifting music and all of that stuff. They, they changed their advertising 180 degrees. And that was one of the biggest turnarounds in a campaign from the end of the Democratic Convention to the election was a massive, it was something like a 25% point turnaround from how far Dukakis was ahead to what Bush ultimately won by. Fantastic, but they knew when to stop going negative. They knew when the negative had gained them enough and was starting to hurt. And that's, it's hard to know. I mean, it, it takes, takes good campaign uh, strategists to know these things. So, uh, this is <laughs> another copyright violation. Uh, you know, what is happening? Okay, how much, of what is going on? Um, First of all, in the future, the Supreme Court, unless there is a substantial change in the membership of the court, is not going to override uh, Citizens United, is not going to accept and, and override uh, speech now. Uh, you know, things aren't going to change that dramatically. You know, keep in mind, it took uh, about 34 years to get from Buckley to uh, Citizens United. And, and again, certainly, the membership of the current court is not likely to overturn its own precedent. So that's not going to change. Money's out there. And people who feel uh, that they can make a difference uh, will continue giving. And whether we're talking about uh, individuals who are because of their uh, business interest, uh, feel that their, their bits, business interest or personal financial interest is benefited by a particular candidate or uh, party, um, you know, they're going to continue to give. Um, and barring a Great Depression type of change, you know, keep it on. we're in a recession, we all know that, and still campaign money, you know, and there's a lot of, of income disparity in, in American society. Those people who can afford will continue uh, to give. As I just said, campaign advertising, negative advertising does work. And so the candidates are going to continue relying on it uh, to the point that they think it benefits them. Um, yeah. We know there are examples of, of, of negative, going too negative. Uh, I'm quite convinced, for example, that uh, one of the reasons that uh, Dave Friedenthal uh, was elected governor in, in 2002 was that um, Eli Bebout made a mistake going negative in the Republican primaries. Uh, you know, angered enough Republican voters that they either set out the election or they voted for Friedenthal. 
so I mean, you have to know what you're doing. Uh, you have to know when, when to time them and how negative to be. One of the concerns I have is, will confidence in government continue to erode? Uh, one of the things we know is that Americans are less enthusiastic about the people who govern them now than they were 40 or 50 years ago. We still like the American system, we just don't like the people. Um, this is a chart, this is from a Gallup poll that asked how much confidence you have, and they ask on a whole array of institutions. It's not just governmental, it's, it's economic, it's social, medical. Uh, Gallup started doing this in 1973. This is the starting point. The red line is Congress. And you see that the most recent one, which was June of this year, 13% of the American people said, surveyed said they had confidence in Congress as an institution. Uh, that's up from 2010. I guess, there's, I guess there's something to, you know, if you're really looking for, for the, a silver lining, uh, uh, you see the presidency, uh, has, they, they only started asking about the presidency uh, around 1990. Uh, you see how that has gone up and down, and if I showed you the approval of the, in, the person who's president at the time, you would see these two lines go very much hand in hand. Uh, our confidence in the presidency is tied very much to our confidence or our approval of the existing president. Congress as a more uh, faceless institution, uh, it gets negative and it doesn't shift so much. Uh, but you do see, I mean, the, the big drop uh, uh, occurring, uh, you know, starting about uh, uh, 2004. Of course, now what's the real irony of this? 90% of the congressmen who seek re-election this year will be re-elected. We hate our Congress and love our congressmen. Uh, we've known that for many years now. Uh, you know, it's a situ situation that, uh, you know, the congressmen we know, you know, I mean, Wyoming as, a, as, a, as an electorate, the potty, a body, has more confidence in Cynthia Lummis representing Wyoming opinion and we certainly feel that those congressmen from New England or California or wherever don't know us. And so we don't, you know, those are the bad ones, not ours. You know, ours, ours are, are, you know, ours is one of those we have confidence in, but we just don't have any confidence in the other 434 members of the House. Uh, of course, that person who's sitting uh, in the 14th district of New York in east side of Manhattan is wondering what's wrong with that congresswoman from Wyoming. I mean, you know, we all have confidence in, in the person who reflects our own, and who we, whom we know. But this is, this is where I, I get concerned, because, you know, you, you do need a certain level of support. Now, I'm not, I'm not expecting that uh, we're going to have a complete breakdown in the uh, American system of government, uh, you, know, uh, you know, but, you do want to have people who feel the government is working for solutions and accepting, if you've got confidence that somebody is going to make good decisions, then you, try, then, then, then you, feel, you, you accept that they're going to make a decision well on your behalf. If you lose confidence, then you don't believe that person is going to do anything right. Now, I have a friend who... Um, who talks about, who, whose analogy is government is a plumber. How many of us call a plumber when everything is working well in the house? Okay, government is there to fix the problem. And if you've got confidence in the plumber you've called, then you can, you feel good, he's going to come in, he's going to repair the leak, and all is going to be well. If you've gone through the list of plumbers that you trust and have to fall down on somebody that you've never heard of before, you don't have confidence in that person. Well, government's the same thing. If we lose confidence in government, then there are th threats to the political system more broadly. Our best hope is the American voter.
Uh, I have been known to say to, to friends, uh, don't underestimate the stupidity of the American voter. Uh, but, but really, I mean, it's, it's, you know, do we elect good people? And then do we trust? Part of it is, do we trust people elsewhere to elect good people? And that's what really the, the, the problem of, of, you know, of, of Congress. You know, I know I'm, I've known a lot of people in public life. I've never known any member of Congress well. Uh, I've gotten to know Al uh, Simpson over a few years uh, that he's been connected with our department. Um, but some, Al Simpson was somebody that I, um, you know, had a lot of respect for, even uh, before I'd ever met him. So I really didn't feel he was somebody, I mean, he could occasionally go off, you know, and, 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 and he will admit that, uh, you know. Uh, you know, PBS did a, 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 a biography, if you will, of him, you know, a year or so ago. Uh, and, and he acknowledged some places where he went over the line. Uh, but, you know, you never thought this was a bad person. Uh, you know, what we have to have is confidence that everywhere else, people are also making choices of good people. Unfortunately, it's the ones that, that the exceptions to the rule that dominate our thought process, right? Okay? It's the congressman who gets caught p taking bribes, and we project that onto all of them. You know, it's, it's the old classic cliche of one bad apple. Uh, what we have to believe is that one bad apple, that one uh, uh, corrupt congressman is not um, uh, going to spoil it all. Oh, let's finish with, again, you can tell I waste a lot of time looking at political cartoons. Uh, God, the internet is horrible for uh, a distraction. You know, I could, I could look for political cartoons or I could grade those papers. Anyway, you know, d keep in mind that, you know, democracy is, is difficult. Uh, one of the things uh, that I always try to remind our students, my students, is we're living in a democracy that, if you think about it, is 300 years old. Okay? The, actually, prob probably even 400. Because we brought democracy, British-style democracy, to this continent in the American colonies. And it evolved. It's taken a lot of time. But we've reached a point where democracy is pretty well settled. There's a lot of countries that are, are trying to figure it out. And one of the things I think we have to do is remember that they need time to work it out just as we needed time to work it out. So I, I encourage everyone to be patient, not only with the American system, but with emerging democracies as well. And with that, I will I'll throw the the floor open to questions. Yes, ma'am. Two related questions. Uh, do you think voters really differentiate between uh, campaign ads by the super PACs and those by the candidates? And also related, how effective are these super PAC advertising? OK. Um, the first question was, do, candidate, do, do voters differentiate between the candidates' ads and the other organizations have? The answer to that is no. Uh, we definitely know that from studies that were done before the, all the disclaimer requirements, but I've not seen anything to, that any studies that have said that, A, now that the disclaimer requirements are there, uh, you know, you know the, the, the end of the ad of, of, a, of a Priorities USA action, the disclaimer is so fast, and the print is so small and blurry that, you know, and if, if you're really listening to it anyway, you probably already know. Uh, so anyway, no, they don't. Um, how effective are the super PACs? What's happened is, in some respects, the super PACs have begun to take over the, the negative side. Uh, now, there's a lot of negative Romney and, uh, against Obama and Obama against Romney ads out there. Uh, but it, in the, I'm working off from just impressions of what, what little study has been done on that. Again, we're dealing with something that's new to presidential campaigns this year. So, you know, we're, we're all, of the, all, of the, all of us that are talking about this is real seat of the pants analysis. Um, but there, there was a point earlier in the year, at least, where the super PACs being negative allowed the candidate to be positive. And on the assumption that the voter was drawing a distinction, which was probably not true. Um, but but I, I think it's because people don't make a distinction between who's actually running it 
that I don't think that we can say one or the other is more influential. I mean, they're, they're adding to the volume of ads. That's certainly uh, part of it. You know, so there's more of them because of super PACs. There's just, whether they're more influential or not, I don't know. I mean, you have to, it's hard to distinguish. I mean, I, if in, unless they start with a disclaimer, because sometimes the president, sometimes the candidate ads will actually begin with a disclaimer rather than putting it at the end. And if they don't put the, the disclaimer at the beginning, uh, it's a little hard even for me, uh, and I watch these, keep in mind this is professional uh, interest, this is spectator sport. <laughs> so uh, I do try to watch, you know, okay, you know, what's being done here? Uh, is this an effective ad, is it not? Uh, and if they haven't started with the disclaimer, I have a lot of time figuring out who it's about, who's running it before I, they get to the end. Yes, sir? Do you view the, uh, the intermittent attack on the electoral college as white noise, or is it in any way serious? I'm glad those students who heard me predict that if we had an election where uh, the candidate with the, who got the most popular votes didn't win the presidency, that we would get rid of the electoral college. Can't come back and find me now. <laughs> I was proven wrong in 2000. Um, it's not the first bad prediction I, I've made, I should say. Uh, I, I, th I think that the um, electoral college is so ingrained that um, you know, to change it requires a constitutional amendment. And the threshold for that is so high that small states uh, like Wyoming, who mathematically each individual in, in Wyoming has a greater influence on the election outcome than, a, than an individual voter in California uh, or any other state for that matter. Uh, so, I mean, there's enough small states who under, who, where the, the uh, people think that mathematical advantage is important to them that they're never going to let a, an amendment abolishing the Electoral College go through. Uh, unless, unless we get an election where, you know, it's a very big split. Okay, somebody wins a popular vote by five, six percent and loses, and there doesn't seem to be any irregularities. In, in almost all of the instances where the popular vote winner did not win the election, there has been some irregularity. Uh, in 2000, it was the vote count in Florida that all the controversy on that, the issue of the Electoral College and its fairness within and democratic principles got lost in the debate. Uh, I mean, there's all sorts of, you know, the winner-take-all rule that applies in most states. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, you know, the fact that the, the, the popular candidate cannot w might not win, those are, those are basic majority rule problems, but they get lost because the controversy that goes with it is not simply about that issue, it's about something else. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> projection on uh, percentage of people who vote who are undecided. Right now, polls are showing undecideds as relatively small, I don't know, six, seven, eight percent, I think maybe not even that high. Um, academic studies will ask people, you know, post-election, when did you decide? Uh, that number has been declining over the years. Uh, since you know, the, the, this, this, this study, it was the study that does this was initiated in the 1950s. Um, but what we do know is that people will give an answer, you know, if the election were held today, who would you vote for? People will give an answer, and then pollsters have learned to, to ask the follow-up of, you know, how firm is your support? And what we know is uh, the support for both Romney and Obama, but particularly for Romney, is a little soft. That there seem to be people who are saying now that, yeah, if the election were today, I'd vote for this one, but they're not saying that's definite and I'm, gonna, I'm never going to change my mind. Uh, so there's still some people out there to be shifted, whether they can be or whether that inclination keeps moving forward, uh, it's hard to say. Let me come over to this side. Yes, sir, you had your hand up earlier. You didn't seem to think that the Roberts Court was going to push the uh, impact of corporations and, and big money contributors any further than it already has. I saying that okay. I, I'm saying that that the Roberts Court is not going to reverse itself. 
and say that the limits on the ban on corporate contributions or the limit or, or putting in limits on independent expenditure only PACs will change. That they're going to, you know, because again, the two big things corporations and unions cannot contribute, and they can give, and individuals can give unlimited amounts to an expenditure only political action committee. That is a the, the independent expenditure only. That is, they're spending on their own. They're not linking to a candidate in any way, officially. I mean, they're not coordinated with a candidate. Those are what are unlimited. And I, I just don't see, since they've just made these rulings, that they're likely to overturn them. What the, what the Robert Courts was overturning were precedents that were uh, 34 to 60 years old in terms of campaign finance law. They weren't overturning something they had decided three or four years ago. In fact, what's happened with the Roberts Court uh, since McCain-Feingold was passed is that you know the first challenge is okay, this falls, but this is okay, and the next time this is no longer okay, but this one thing is still okay. And, and what happened eventually, almost all of McCain-Feingold, except the disclaimer requirement, has been chipped away. Uh, so I don't, but I don't see the court. I mean, these are going to be. There will be a couple of changes in the court. I mean, they're they're old enough. I mean, most of the justices are old enough. There's going to be some changes, but I don't see, it's not going to be like there's going to be a 50% per, you know, change or a 70% change in the makeup of the court, and that many new on the other side of the issue that's going to make it reverse itself this quickly. The court usually takes a long time to reverse itself. But you don't see it loosening the restrictions on individual contributions to Oh, on uh, that one? Uh, no, because they... That has not been, I'll take it back, I, I believe that has been just kind of accepted in one of the prior decisions. I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to run these decisions back through my mind here and I'm uh, having a hard time. The, the memory chip is not working as well as it should. Uh, but I, I, I don't see, because they've accepted that there is, that, that there is a, that Congress has an interest in protecting democracy that individual direct ties to a candidate, there's a democratic interest being protected by putting that limit in there, and they've accepted that. What they've not accepted is that you can limit what somebody can go off and do on their own. Now, realize, you know, get, you know the candidates know who's giving to these super PACs and what the super PACs are doing. It's not like, you know, it's a, this is all being done in a vacuum. Uh, so there is still there, there a knowledge of it, but I don't think that they're going to go so far as to go back and say, hey, the contribution limit uh, has to go. I'll take one more. I know Paul is telling us we're almost ready for lunch. Yeah. I want to go back to the bigger picture. You ended with a cartoon about Egyptian mm -hmm. voting. Um, the whole Arab Spring thing. Uh, the, the Bush push for the exportation of American style democracy, and incidentally, it was mostly European style democracy mm -hmm. to these countries. Are, but now, all of a sudden, they're voting for the parties and candidates that, oh, guess what? Not our favorite, not the ones. We want to both control them and have them have democracy. It seems to me they're we're working at cross purposes. Mm -hmm. How is our foreign policy going to evolve to do? Uh, Boy, Gene Garrison, who's our foreign pol American foreign policy expert, really should be here to answer this question, or uh, Nevin Aiken, who, who knows about democratization. Um, yeah, okay, that, that this is a very issue. We just had General James Mattis, the commander of CENCOM, on campus a couple of days ago. Um, yeah, and, and he acknowledged this is a problem. Um, what, what Americans, personal opinion thrown in here, there has to be a consistency. America has to accept that there's going to be uh, democratic movements that don't agree with us. Uh, you know, so, you know, and adapt. And Mattis's point, one of his points the other day, was, okay, you adapt. You, you know, it's not like everybody in a country is against you, but if you, if you have the democratic procedures in place, you have the opportunity for those who are more friendly toward you to evolve into the majority. But what it takes is it takes a commitment within that society to democratic processes. And, th and that's what's difficult in exporting a political system, whether it's a Western-style democracy or American, whatever, is the culture has to buy into it. You know, 
The people have to accept that if we lose, we simply wait three years or four years or five years, whatever, to the next election and then try again. Not that we attempt a military revolt, a military style revolt. And that's what's difficult, is in societies that have no tradition of democracy, um, to really get them established. An example, uh, very quickly, to, to, that I've cited with my students before, democracy took hold in post-World War II Germany relatively quickly because it had a history of democracy. It, in, the, in the 19th century and early 20th century, it had developed those democratic processes that got perverted for a dozen years. But the vestiges of, demo of democratic culture were still there, and so democracy could move forward very quickly. Um, Japan, in a similar way, was able to move quickly. You take a country that's never had a tradition of democracy, and it takes a long time to accept when you lose an election that the world hasn't ended, and that if you wait and make your case that you can become the majority. Again, you can go back. I mean, there's, there, there's, there are times in American democracy, quote unquote, where the losers did not take it well. Um, <laughs> You know, but there's also the situation, you, know, you can remember the, 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 the 1876 election was quite flat out stolen through fraud in, th in three states, in two states really, in, in one little bit. Um, you know, but we accepted and we moved on because we had developed the culture of accepting it and moving on. And that's what, what's going to have to happen in these emerging, whether, it, whether it's Arab nations or Eastern European nations are you know, still struggling with some of this, too, in the post-communist era. Dr. King, thank you very much. Thank you.